final lecture. These are just 10 quick tips. If you've attended uh, my courses yesterday and today, it's going to be a synopsis of some of the key points that you heard me repeat several times. Fat is bioactive. This is a, such a critical point because people use fat as a bioinert, hyaluronic acid-based product, and it's absolutely not. It's actually a live graft. And so it's weight dependent, and people that gain weight will actually have more exuberant issues down the line. So for me, what I do, it's very important, is to, to look at their history of how, what their weight history is. If they have constantly gained and lost weight, and they've all of a sudden lost weight, they lost 50 pounds, they're coming in excited to do a, a fat transfer, that's the worst time. So if someone is in a process of losing weight and they're cyclical in their nature of fat loss then or weight loss, I typically will do it about a third into their weight loss rather than all the way down and then buttress it with hyaluronic acid products as they go down to their lowest weight because I don't trust they're not going to gain it back, especially if they've had a history of weight gain um, in the past. So using it in young patients, asymmetrically, metabolically unstable patients are problematic because if you do it in a 20 year old and you're putting it in there you don't know how that person is going to mature especially if their family history is obesity you have to be careful in using it because it is bioactive and along that point it's permanent so people I hear this all the time fat lasts about two years, fat lasts about three years, fat lasts about one year well where do these arbitrary numbers come from? It's a graft and this is an example. This is a lady that I do a lot of lip corrections on. She's 10 years out. She said she had silicone injected in her lips. So I was all ready to, to reduce the silicone. I opened the lip and I said, you had a fat transfer. She says, oh yeah. I, didn't, I thought this was all silicone issue. I said, no, I don't see any silicone here. And I do a ton of silicone corrections, which looks like a grayish color. And it's solid. I said, these are all fat lobules 10 years out. And I said, did you gain weight in the last five, 10 years? She says, yeah, I've been progressively gaining weight, about 25 pounds and uh, her face looked distorted as well. So I said, first of all, lose some weight. We're going to reduce the fat here. Um, and it is real and it's live and it's permanent. So you know, there's a variable resorption of fat. There's a percentage of fat that resorbs, but the percentage that takes, which is variable, uh, and I believe that there's not one processing method that it's, it's a gold standard, but what takes, takes, and it's there for life. So you need to know the permanent nature of fat grafting. This is not a, a short-lived product. The lower eyelid is safe and so the trick here as I was demonstrating this morning and yesterday is it's perpendicular unlike fillers when I use microcannulas I go parallel I go perpendicular I release the arcus marginalis and I, I use my non-dominant hand as a guiding force and as a tactile feedback and just gently place a little bit at a time and you really if you you stay about no more than three cc's three and a half cc's in, in, in each eyelid and in put it in, in an incremental fashion across the whole uh, arc of the lower eyelid, you typically don't get problems. I mean, it, uh, lower eyelid is very safe. It sounds so scary, but if you don't go parallel and you go deep and you release that arcus so that you don't place it on one side of the orbital rim, it's pretty safe. Um, the anterior cheek, this used to be one of the most important areas to fill because it's so beautiful. Actually, it's really disturbing now. And the reason for it, it's a, not only a static issue, it's a dynamic problem. People that smile, they get into the anterior cheek. So most of the talks I talked about this morning is moving my work to the perimeter. So a lot of perimeter work, temple, outer cheek. When I fill the outer cheek, I put in two, three, or four cc's oftentimes. And the anterior cheek, I used to only put in about one to one and a half cc's, and that seems like a very negligible amount but it actually is over exuberant sometimes. I now oftentimes put zero. And I think the reason is as I start to support the lower eyelid and support the outer face, there's enough in the anterior cheek. I can always come back and put some HAs. So I am very, very um, aware of the anterior cheek being a problem area rather than a, a beautiful area because also the fat retention in this area is higher. So I typically am moving away from the anterior cheek. If anything, don't put anything in it. It may sound crazy, but I think that's the new uh, feeling. Fillers are the new fat. My, I've had a tremendous uptick from, since October 2010 when I started using microcannulas. And I really believe now that I can do great work with fillers. Now, if someone's very volume depleted and they're metabolically stable, fat is still an amazing modality. You just have to pick your patient candidacy. You've heard from Dr. Baji. It's, that's the key thing. This is not one size fits all. Fat is not an evil thing, and fat is not the solution to all problems. And the le point of this short lecture is just to get through some of the limitations and that communication skill that you need as a physician for, to your patient is so critical because if you talk to your patient and, under, and tell them these limitations, there's, th that can 
truly help solve it. And this is one of them. Fat is not good for surface flaws. I have people trying to use this as, as an HA. They try to fill a little wrinkle. They try to make this little area go away. And there's variable resorption. You don't know exactly how much resorbs. But if you're trying to use fat as a mattress foundation for the face rather than the duvet or the sheets, and you build this beautiful shape, you know, it changes the blink. People look better after a fat graft if it's done artistically. And if, it's, if you're just there to treat surface flaws, you're going to have disappointed patients. You're going to be disappointed, and, and you don't want to keep chasing that. Cut the voodoo. I think there's too much voodoo. Stem cells, PRP. I tried PRP for a year. I love PRP for hair. It's fantastic. I gave a lecture on it this morning. But I think there's a lot of stuff out there in terms of it has to be done exactly this way. Uh, where I like is just to focus really on the artistry and, and, and what can be done there. But I think there's a lot of ways to process it. But always, always under correct. Don't, don't get crazy and exuberant with this. And I really believe, I tell my patients, all my patients, your, your fat is not going to be perfect. And I'm going I'm I'm to need some fillers to, to micro finesse it. And, and you say, well, why don't you just do fillers to begin with? Well, fat can be a global, beautiful, permanent, long-term fill. And I believe HAs, when it's done subtly in small areas, can actually have the same durability of fat grafting. Um, I, my pay, my uh, staff has been filled with HAs 10 years ago, and they're still maintaining it. So uh, single session. Uh, I, don't, I tell my patients, we're not going to do a touch-up. We're not going back to the OR three times, because fat has its role. It's going to have a certain percentage to take. Now, why don't I go back several times? One, I told you in lesson six, I'm not going to get it corrected with fat. I'm going to... I'm either going to continue to undercorrect it or I'm going to overcorrect it because fat is a baseline deep mattress fill and is not meant for microcorrection of the face. If you do that, I think you're going to be exhausted and the patient will be as well. So I tell my patients beforehand that we're going to need some filler touch-ups and if they don't get it, great. It's much better that at least I tell them on the front end. So it's an education rather than an excuse. As you know, they're the same thing. The only difference is an education I tell them before the procedure and excuses afterwards. I don't like excuses. And really, one plus one equals three. Look at all the little things that you have. If you're a surgeon, think non-surgically. And if you're a non-surgeon and you have some surgical ab abilities, think surgically. Because the more tools you have, you don't, you don't just do everything through one method. You have more of an open uh, platform of doing things. And as you heard Susan say, you know, be an artist. Think like an artist. Use your right brain. Is the patient actually more attractive when you're done, or they just have a less of a fold? Are, does the lip look prettier, or is it just larger? You know, are they looking better? I, I watched this uh, Italian movie about, um, about clothing design, about men's suits. And uh, this Japanese guy that was training with this Italian, um, old Italian tailor, uh, he said, part of my training for the first year was to go to a museum. Also, I learned how to drink coffee. And I had to go, to, I had to go and, and, and no, learn how to live life. And I think that's part of uh, being a good uh, aesthetic surgeon, aesthetic uh, provider, is to really appreciate beauty and, and have that expression of beauty in every facet of your life. Thank you very much.